بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين uh, Brothers and sisters, welcome again to another class in the series of the famous hadith of Jibreel عليه السلام teaching us the pillars of Islam and the pillars and articles of faith amongst other things in the previous classes, we've discussed belief in Allah Azza wa Jal and belief in the angels. Today's class is going to be addressing belief in the books. And if you uh, <clears throat> recollect, we said that this is the logical sequence uh, of order uh, in, in listing the articles or pillars of faith. Uh, the main thing is belief in Allah Azza wa Jal, without which you don't believe in anything. And then uh, the other things uh, stem out or branch out of this belief. And then Allah Azza wa Jal sends messengers from his side, represented by the angels, with a message as books to the messengers on earth, which are the messengers to the people. So this was this is a, a logical sequence of order in discussing the articles or pillars of faith. Uh, today we will be discussing the issue of belief in the divine books. Uh, what does it mean to believe in these books? Well, first of all, to firmly believe that they were all uh, revealed or sent down by Allah Azza wa Jal, that they were all true and that all happiness and bliss uh, lie in believing in these books to the people to whom they were sent and for those uh, to whom they were sent, those who believed in them at the time of the revelation uh, and abided by them and adhered to them, uh, they will be rescued and gain the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal. And those who denied it and rejected it will be destroyed and deserving to, uh, of the punishment of Allah Azza wa Jal. And uh, finally, to believe that the Quran is the last and final message, divine message sent down by Allah Azza wa Jal to his messengers. Uh, regarding the names of the books of Allah Azza wa Jal, there are books that were mentioned in the Quran, named in the Quran, and there were others that were not. Amongst the named books in the Quran, uh, there was a Torah, the Torah, an Injil, the Gospel, and the uh, Zabur, the uh, Palms of David, and the scriptures of Ibrahim. Uh, and Musa and Moses. Uh, we have to address the issue of, since we're talking about belief in books, uh, we have to address the issue of what makes the Quran from amongst all the books that were uh, revealed by Allah or sent down by Allah, what makes it distinct or what is the distinct feature or features of the Quran compared to, uh, to the others. Uh, regarding the Quran, we have to believe in every detail that came in it, not just a general belief in, in the Quran, as we generally believe in the other books, but that's due to the fact that the other books were subject to alteration and change. And that's why we believe in them in general, but in the Quran, we believe in every specific detail mentioned in the Quran alongside the general belief in it as a book from Allah uh, Quran was the Quran was sent down over intervals in stages uh, unlike the others Allah Azza wa Jal says wa Quranan faraqnahu litaqra'ahu 'ala an-nas 'ala mukthin wa nazzalnahu tanzila it is a Quran, we have revealed in stages that you may recite it to people 
in, uh, at intervals. And uh, we have sent it down progressively. What is the reason behind not sending the Quran down to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all in one go, all at once? Well, the Quran was uh, legislating to people at different periods of times, different legislations, and therefore it needed to be sent down uh, according to that situation. There were situations that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked certain matters and Allah Azza wa revealed the Qur'an answering. That's why you see in the Qur'an many verses in which Allah Azza wa says, يَسْأَلُونَكْ وَيَسْأَلُونَكْ They ask you, they ask you, and then Allah Azza wa gives the answer to the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. We have to believe that the Qur'an uh, is dominant. It has the supreme authority over the, the other books or scriptures. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَمُهَيْمِنًا عَلَيْهِ We have revealed to you, O Prophet, O Muhammad, this book in truth, the Quran, as a confirmation of previous scriptures, and supreme authority on them. And the final point uh, is that Allah Azza wa Jal has sent it as the final message and has preserved it or took upon himself to preserve the Quran from change and alteration. Allah says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra Indeed, it is we who have sent down the dhikr, which is Al-Quran, and it is we who will preserve it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The logical question to be asked, did Allah Azza wa Jal take upon himself preserving previous scriptures, previous books he sent down, and the answer is no. Allah Azza wa Jal did that only with the Quran. And the Quran is preserved and uh, reality testifies to that. Up until now, from 14 and a half centuries ago, the Quran is being conveyed generation after generation with authentic chain of narrators going down from from this time back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will not find a difference, not in a sentence or a page, not in a letter in the Quran. The Quran has been preserved and protected from change and alter and alteration by Allah Azza wa Jal, and even the enemies cannot find a, a two copies that differ from one another. Whereas this is not the case in any of the other scriptures. Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, uh, regarding the, the other books, Allah Azza wa Jal has made the responsibility of reserving, uh, preserving and guarding the, the, uh, the previous books to those to whom it was sent upon. Allah says, Inna anzalna tawrata fiha hudan wa nur. يَحْكُمُ بِهَا النَّبِيُّونَ الَّذِينَ أَسْلَمُوا لِلَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالرَّبَّانِيُّونَ وَالْأَحْبَارُ بِمَا اسْتُحْفِظُوا مِنْ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَكَانُوا عَلَيْهِ شُهَدًا Indeed, we sent down the Torah in which was guidance and light. The prophets who submitted to Allah judged by it for the Jews, as did the rabbis and scholars by that with which they were entrusted of the scripture of Allah and they were witnesses thereto. Therefore, the uh, preservation of the previous books were not the responsibility or Allah Azza wa did not take it upon himself to preserve it, but rather made it the responsibility of those upon whom they were sent. And this is why if you take the uh, the Bible, which is a compilation of the New Testament and the, the Old Testament, you cannot hardly find 
two versions that are exactly identical. You have so many versions of uh, the Bible. In, in many cases, the, the different versions are printed within the same country, but yet they're not identical. What is the wisdom of Allah Azza wa preserving the Quran and not the other scriptures or, or books? All the, uh, the previous books, the, the uh, scriptures of uh, Ibrahim, the Palms, the, the Torah, the Injil, they were sent down for a certain period to a given nation or given uh, people. Uh, and they were not sent as an eternal message. Because had this been the case, then from the time of Ibrahim, there was no need to, to send anything else. We would not have seen the Torah or the Injil or the Quran for that matter. Therefore, it was, uh, or they were books for a given period and a given uh, nation or people. And Allah Azza wa again entrusted those upon whom they were uh, sent down to guard it and preserve it from alteration and change. Uh, another reason or wisdom scholars mention regarding why the Quran and not others. The others were not uh, preserved, as we said, and Allah entrusted people to preserve it so that Allah will test the uh, scholars, the rabbis, the monks, the priests in uh, shouldering the responsibility Allah Azza wa Jal attached to them and to see if they would truly believe in these books that were revealed which made mention of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when he arrives Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for those who follow or claim to truly follow the books of Allah Azza wa Jal to see if they would actually submit and believe in his message sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or would they insist in being stubborn and reject and deny the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and conceal the truth from their followers. Another point is that it is a test for the followers of the other books, uh, namely At-Tawrah and Al-Injil, to see if these people would believe in the Quran, in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, seeing that their books have been changed and altered, and at the same time, seeing that the Quran is the only thing or the only book that has been preserved and in, 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 uh, in its original uh, form since the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received it and conveyed it to the uh, followers radiyallahu anhum, the companions, and from them uh, down to us. Uh, the final point here, since the miracle of every messenger or prophet uh, were limited to a period of time and a place, uh, there was a need to have an eternal message or book or an eternal rather miracle that's not limited uh, to a certain period of time or uh, a certain group of people or a certain nation. Uh, and that's why Allah Azza wa Jal, when he sent the Quran, he sent it as a message. And as a miracle to the Prophet ﷺ, with which Allah challenged with its eloquence, the eloquence of the Arabs, who were the most eloquent in the uh, Arabic language. And he challenged them to bring the like of the Quran, even if it was one surah. Allah says, قُلْ لَإِنِ جِتَمَعَةِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لا يأتون بمثله ولو كان بعضهم لبعض ظهيرا 
Say, O Prophet, O Muhammad, if all humans and jinn were to come together to produce the equivalent of the, this Quran, they could not produce its equal, no matter how they supported each other. So the challenge and the miracle of the Quran continues to be eternal, and that's why it needs to be, or it needed to be preserved and guarded by Allah Azza wa Jal. Whereas the other miracles and books were uh, confined to a certain period of time and a place in some cases and a group of people. Uh, let's talk now about the rights of the Quran. As Muslims, we have to believe in the Quran. And this is the first and foremost right of the Quran is to truly and firmly believe that this is the word of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal commanded us to believe. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, amanu billahi wa rasoolihi wal kitab alladhi nazzala ala rasoolihi. O you who have believed, believe in Allah and His Messenger and the book He has sent down upon His Messenger. Al-Qurtubi said, this is referring to Al-Quran. The second right is to recite the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal commanded Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the most Allah fearful, Allah conscious, the most pious, the most committed of all uh, human beings to the message of Allah Azza wa Jal, to the Quran. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal commanded him saying, وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Recite the Quran properly in a measured way. One of the things or few matters that can uh, assist a person to recite the Quran properly, knowing that I am addressing uh, a good number of brothers and sisters who are uh, new reverts to Quran or some who have been far and come to start practicing their faith, alhamdulillah. Uh, and since there are Uh, English speakers at large, if not all, then this addresses them in the first place. One of the things that help uh, a person uh, recite the Quran properly is to, to learn the Arabic language. Uh, and this is not difficult, by the way. Um, even if, you're, if you believe that you're old or older, uh, it's never too late. Uh, I have a relative who teaches non-Arabic speakers uh, how to recite the Qur'an. Uh, and it's just surprising uh, when someone is truthful with themselves, sincere to Allah Azza wa Jal, how Allah facilitates the matter. And in a, a period that's not long at all, uh, they become able to look at the book of Allah Azza wa Jal and actually recite it. So number one is to learn the uh, Arabic language. Number two, which comes after that, is to learn the rules of recitation, which is called a tajweed. And number three is to be committed and set a uh, certain period of time daily. And this cannot be compromised for any reason, as if it is Uh, a job that you have, which you cannot miss, otherwise they will cut off from your uh, salary. Well, we have to be as serious and more serious than that when it comes to the Book of Allah. Another one of the rights of the Book of Allah is to memorize it. It's a great honor to walk around having the Quran or parts of the Quran memorized by heart. I, must, I must, must say one thing here that the companions did not all memorize the entire Quran. So we're not saying that this is an obligation by, anything, by any means. We're just saying that this is really encouraged, strongly encouraged, because uh, one of the companions, Abu Umama, radiyallahu anhu, said, Memorize the Qur'an, for Allah will not punish a slave 
who has memorized the Quran. Uh, in the dunya, in the worldly life, we need to memorize enough that uh, with which or through which we can uh, pray five daily prayers. And when we need to do ruqya, when we are unwell, we, we need to memorize enough to do the ruqya. This is in this life. In the hereafter, Allah Azza wa Jal has set a great reward for those who memorize the Qur'an. And the more you, mem you memorize, the better you are. Uh, in, in the book of Imam al-Tirmidhi, and it was classed as uh, authentic by an Albani. The Prophet Sallallahu said, on the day of judgment, it will be said to the person who memorizes the Qur'an, recite and ascend in ranks as you used to recite when you were in the worldly life. Your rank will be at the last ayah, the last verse you recite. In the Quran, there are more than 6,200 verses, ayahs. So it's our choice now to decide which one of these 6,200 ranks we wish to be at when it comes time to meet Allah Azza wa Jal or on the day of resurrection. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal the highest rank of Jannah. Allahumma ameen. Uh, we're now we're ascending in importance here, reflecting and pondering upon the Quran. This is the principle in or when reciting the Quran or reading the Quran. Because the Quran was sent down to be reflected upon and pardoned, pondered upon. It wasn't sent down to read as we read newspapers. Allah Azza wa says, كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته. A blessed, a blessed book which we have sent down to you, O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, that they might reflect upon its verses. So this is why it was sent down. As a matter of fact, Allah عز وجل reproached and rebuked those who were heedless from reflecting and pondering upon the Qur'an. Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقُفَالُهَا Will they not reflect upon the Qur'an or are there locks upon their hearts? Allah considers those who do not reflect upon, upon the Qur'an as if they have locks on their hearts. It doesn't open up, it doesn't soften up. And trust me, brothers and sisters, the more you recite the Quran, the more your heart softens, becomes so tender, becomes so attached to Allah Azza wa Jal. It gives you an amazing feeling. You get the chills and shivers at times when you read the Quran, as beautiful as the words of Allah are. You don't understand it? Read the translation of the Quran. And then you will see what I'm talking about. I'm sure the brothers and sisters have all experienced these feelings I'm talking about. Next point is acting upon implementing the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal sent the Quran as a way of life, as a code of life to act upon it to implement it practically in our daily life. Our predecessors, our Salaf, used to recite the Quran in a way reflecting their readiness to act upon it immediately. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, radiallahu anhu. He said, whenever you hear a verse saying, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, O oh, you who have believed, then listen attentively. For there either is good that you're being commanded to do so, act upon it, or evil you're commanded to refrain from, so be ready to stay away from. Uh, to give a, uh, an example, 
it's an amazing example. Whenever I read this story, I just become, you know, like they say, deaf, dumb, mute. I, I just don't know what to say or how to act. In the book of an Imam, a Muslim, uh, when it, it, it reports that when the verses of uh, the Quran forbidding consuming intoxicants, khamr, were sent down, the Prophet وسلم, sent a messenger to the people saying, Allah has made khamr haram, forbidden. So whoever hears this verse, the verse of forbidding khamr, and he has any of this khamr, then let him not consume it, nor sell it. Don't benefit from it. You don't drink it, and you don't sell it to get your money back. What was the result of this? They immediately, without any reluctance or hesitation, without asking questions, without feeling, oh, we should have been prepared, we, you know, at least let us sell it and get some of our money back. No. They immediately went to their containers and poured it out on the street. They spilt it out on the street to the extent that the narration says people continued for days smelling khamr on the streets as much of it the companions had spilt out on the street. You see, this is the difference between people and the ranks of people. I was told once uh, by one of my shiyukh, I asked him a question. He said, if the Prophet I was asking about a certain matter, the ruling of that. So he said that the Prophet Sallallahu said this. And then he said to me, and this, this was one of the wisest words I've ever heard. He said, Hazim, if the Prophet Sallallahu was standing in front of you right now, and he said, Hazim, don't do such and such. What will you say? I said, I will refrain immediately. He said, so don't ask more questions. And that reminds me with, uh, I was reading in one of the books, and in the introduction of the book, it said it was never reported, not even in an inauthentic narration, that any of the companions, whenever they heard a command to refrain from something, that they had asked the Prophet Sallallahu is this really haram or is it just not recommended? Or when they're commanded to do something, is this an obligation or is it something that praised only, it's recommended only, but not mandatory? Never. They immediately say, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا And that's why their generation is the best of all generations. And that's what makes people differ in the rank. That's what makes people differ in the scale of Allah Azza wa Jal and in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. Your readiness to immediately say, we hear and we obey. I hear and I obey. I hear and I comply. I hear and I adhere. I hear and I act upon what I hear. That's the difference between people. And that's what we need to train ourselves to be like, brothers and sisters. Next point is to make the Qur'an our reference. Reference in judgment and making it govern our lives. Uh, because making it the reference for everything, especially for judgment, and making it govern our lives is a fundamental of tawheed of belief in Allah Azza wa Jal. <clears throat> Allah Azza wa Jal described refraining to 
refer to the Quran or referring to other than the Quran as part of the pre-Islamic ignorance. Allah Azza wa says, أَفَحُكْمَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ يَبْغُونَ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حُكْمًا Is it the judgment of the time of pre-Islamic ignorance they desire? But who is better than Allah in judgment? So Allah Azza wa Jal made referring to other than the Quran a judgment that's in accordance to the pre-Islamic era of ignorance. Another right of the Quran is to glorify it. You know, the honor of the thing stems from the honor of, or the words, stem out from the honor of the person speaking them. The more honorable and glorified the person is, the more importance people attach to his words. So now we're talking about Allah and the words of Allah. So what's the lever of honor and glorification that are due to this or to these words and to Allah belongs the loftiest of examples we're not comparing Allah to anyone but this this is just to make the picture clearer and the more you glorify the words of Allah Azza wa Jal, this means the glorification of Allah in your heart is at, at the highest level one of the uh implications, you may say, uh, of glorifying the Qur'an is to attentively listen to it when it's being recited, to feel submissiveness in your heart when you hear it, to cry as the Prophet ﷺ used to cry, as Abu Bakr used to cry, as Umar radiallahu anhu used to cry. Umar, whenever he led the salah, his weeping would be heard at the last roll, and they had no speakers and microphones at the time. Uh, a sign of glorifying the Quran is not to touch it in a state of impurity. We're not going to get into the difference of opinion amongst the scholars, whether or not it is allowed or not, but we're saying even for those who believe that it is okay to touch the Qur'an when you don't have wudu, it is a sign of glorification not to touch it except with wudu. We're not addressing haram and halal, but we're saying that it is a sign. When a person believes something is allowed, but yet he does more, that's a stronger sign of his glorification to the Qur'an. Uh, not subjecting the Qur'an to... Uh, being humiliated by by any way. Uh, one thing that makes me really, uh, I don't know what to say, disturbed. Uh, rather, it's more than that. But yeah, when I see someone holding the mushaf and then suddenly he just puts it on the floor. Again, I'm not saying that putting the Quran on the floor is haram, but I'm saying... It doesn't go alongside the word glorification. It just doesn't fall under the umbrella of honor in it. It just doesn't, f it's not befitting. It's just, I, I, again, it's a sign of glorification. That's all I'm saying. Uh, teaching it to others. Teaching it to others is a way of gratitude to Allah for having taught you the Qur'an. The, the, uh, the reward for teaching others is something that is uh, amazing. You become the best of the best. The Prophet ﷺ said, and this is reported by Al-Bukhari, he said, the best amongst you. So the best of the best. Who are they? He said, those who learn the Quran and teach it to others. You want to be amongst these, the best of the best, 
learn it for yourself, for your own benefit, and then start teaching others. Uh, one of the scholars uh, died, and one of his students saw him in a dream after his death. He said, O oh, Imam, O oh, Shaykh or scholar, what did Allah do with you? He said, he admitted me into Jannah. He said, by virtue of your knowledge, which you were teaching to the masses, to the large number of people. He said, no, 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 no. He said, then what? He said, by virtue of me teaching Al-Fatiha to the young kids in the neighborhood. Subhanallah. Uh, the last point of today's lecture is going to be uh, about using Quran as a, a cure and a treatment and a remedy. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ We send down of the Qur'an that which is healing and mercy to the believers. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, said, If people truly and sincerely use Fatiha as a cure, as a remedy, Meaning, with certainty and sincerity to Allah Azza wa Then they would see an amazing effect, an impact on their health in curing themselves. He said, I stayed in Mecca for a long period, getting different types of diseases which I found no cure to. And then I started... Uh, treating myself by reciting Al-Fatiha and I saw an amazing effect to that. Where did Ibn al-Qayyim get this Fatiha issue? Well, it's a famous story of a group of the companions, radiallahu anhu. They were on a journey on the way back to Medina. They stopped and uh, at the vicinity of a tribe who were not Muslim. They were non-Muslims. So they asked them to uh, host them, but the non-believers refused. And Allah Azza wa Jal decreed that the head of the tribe was stung by a scorpion or a snake, bit by a snake. So they came to them and they said, do you know Ruqya? Do you know how to say any Ruqya? Because Ruqya existed prior to Islam, but it had shirk. So one of them said, I do. I know how. They said, our master is suffering from this. He said, by Allah, I will not treat him until you give us something in return. So they agreed on a herd of sheep. So he started reciting Al-Fatiha. And after he finished the seventh time, the narration said the man stood up as if nothing was wrong with him. But when the companions took this uh, herd, they said, was what we did right or wrong? They were not sure, should, we, should they eat from it or not? They said, let's not do anything until we reach uh, Medina and ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they went uh, and they told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what had happened. And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam confirmed that Fatiha is a means of treatment and cure, is a remedy. And he said, uh, he confirmed what they did and did not oppose to what they did. 
With this, we conclude uh, today's uh, class. Uh, this is not the end of the topic of belief in books. But since the topic or since the material is uh, longer than what one class, can, we, we already finished the 45 minutes. Uh, so I decided to split it so that I don't summarize it in a, in a, in a way that will make the brothers and sisters miss out on important uh, things related to the issue of belief in books. So we will stop here. Uh, we actually have finished the 45 minutes. And uh, we will continue, inshallah, uh, next week if we are live. Uh, we will continue with part two of belief in the books. And uh, let's open the uh, floor for uh, questions.